Well, week 12, it's been a wonderful journey, and I'm really glad that I've gotten to meet so many of you and, and get to know you through these teachings. Tonight, of course, uh, it just seems very right and very fitting that we end with the subject of love. But before we get caught up in the love uh, teaching, we need to do a little bit of a recap. And how I want to do that is actually with the very diagram that we're going to use tonight. And you'll see in your books that it's like a whirlwind. Okay? This is a spiral. Okay? Now, we've learned from the first lesson on that there are three things that we don't get to do. And the reason we don't get to do them as unto God is because they're God's uh, job, so to speak. They are what God gets to do. And one of them is to seek praise for ourselves. We don't deserve praise. Many of us want praise, and that's not an un, it is a very natural thing to want that. But the only one who actually has the right to be praised or seeking praise here is God. Because if we don't, let him be God, then what happens with us is we start to become um, manipulative or controlling. Ever hear of those words? Mm -hmm. And let me just explain how that happens. We're, you know, we want someone's attention. And you know, this past weekend, I, I got to spend a day with my little one-year-old grandson. And it's amazing how that one, one-year-old a uh, two foot tall little being wants the attention. It's just beautiful and darling and you really do want to give them the attention. But you can see how human nature, if some things that he does goes on, <laughs> is then he's going to learn that other behaviors like manipulation or trying to control to get his own way. And of course, that's not what we want to happen. And so as we work through this diagram, we're going to realize, wow, this happens in many of my relationships too. And so our key verse tonight is Galatians 5, for you have been called to live in freedom, not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature or that flesh, but freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. As we were teaching over these uh, past weeks, then what you come to realize, I hope, is that you can't give away what you don't have. And so if you don't love yourself, and accept yourself for who God made you to be, imperfect as we all are, then how in the world will you really be able to love others? That's what this verse is saying. And this is a, an amazing way that all of us have to begin to start thinking differently. Because we all struggle, I think, more or less, some less and some others more, <laughs> in really genuinely accepting ourselves for who we are. I actually think it's so um, across the board that for even some of you that have a healthy self-esteem and like yourself pretty much, you still love to know that someone else in your life accepts you for who you are, even in your, in your defects, your quirkiness, your individuality. What you, have, what you really are looking for is that blanket of acceptance and unconditional love. James 3.16 says, 
Wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every kind of love. See, we come into this world and we start just looking around and we see things we want, we want to do, we have dreams that we want to accomplish. And if you don't have a solid belief in a God that you can't see but know is there, then you are going to be doing things on your own. This is why Christian uh, couples that have children, um, you know, faith is more caught than taught. Yes. It's absolutely true. Because they, if they see you, let's just give an example. Maybe you're out on the bypass and you go by an accident and you've got a toddler in the car and a baby in the car seat. And they hear mommy say, we have to pray right now. There are people injured over there over there. Let's pray. You know, let's, let's just go to God in prayer. And you just start, even though you're driving, you're just saying, Jesus, we just really need your help over there. Please allow the EMS to get there and help us to realize that, that you're in control. And then all of a sudden, you're going to sense that your children have peace in that car. See, these are things that are caught. You're not telling them Bible stories. You're actually showing them how to live life. And you're doing it the best way, and that's modeling behavior. You see, Christians get a bad rap, and it's because they don't know how to do this. They can talk a good talk, but they sure don't walk that walk. Right? Come on. Yeah. And Christianity would not be where it is in our country, especially. You know, it's treated like a joke. And it's not. This is real life. I think you've come to realize that, is that this is how Jesus wants us to do life, with him in the center and forefront of our thinking, our living, or everything that we do is done with an audience of one. We all know that selfishness destroys relationships. But did you know that when you seek praise and try to control or judge others, that you are an example of selfishness? Yeah, who said ouch? I like that. <laughs> See, what you're doing is you're actually trying to fit your bums in the throne room of the holy God. And you are judging unrighteously instead of loving with unconditional love, like what God wants us to do. James 5, 9 says, Don't grumble about each other, my brothers and sisters, or God will judge you. For look, the great judge is coming. You see, if you don't realize every minute of the day who you are serving, you're going to serve yourself. That's what selfishness does. And so our focus is much more on how we think, what we want, how we're going to do things, what we think we are owed, when actually we aren't owed anything <laughs> but God's love. Seeking praise, controlling, and judging others leads to rejecting people. Now, you may say, okay, now wait a minute, I get these three, but how does my rejecting others lead to this, uh, or become part of this? And if you'll remember in the rejection lesson, we talked a little bit about this, I'm going to talk about it some more, but rejection is knowingly or unknowingly withholding love. Can I say that again? Rejection is knowingly, which means you know that that person wants you to say, I love you, and you are deliberately not. Okay? Or it could be covertly. Maybe they've hurt your feelings, and so you don't look them in the eye, and you just sup sup for a while. And I told you before in my home, uh, you know, silence wasn't golden, it was deadly. You know, you could always tell. But that's rejection. 
and that is knowing or unknowingly withholding love. Until I got into this teaching, I didn't realize I was withholding love. I just was reacting badly to actions that were not good too. But when you start to think, like, what is my behavior to this? How am I contributing to the spiral? Because that's what it is. It's a downward spiral that leads to this broken relationships. I think it's ironic that we live in a world that just is built on relationships. They talk about relationships. We're always seeking how to do better relationships. And yet we've probably never had so many broken relationships. And it really is time for the church, for the body of Christ, to start to live it. Not just talk about it, but really live it. Before you have a baby, take these birth classes and do all these things, but they have the new parents get down on their knees and they walk, they go, they crawl around their house and they're looking for all the things that uh, the baby can get into and what's going to harm the baby. Why do they do that? Because they want to keep the baby safe, don't they? They want to make that baby feel loved and accepted and, and wanted when this is exactly what God's doing with you. He's telling you, look, you gotta stop this. Hey, you know what? How's this working for you? This, hey, this is my job. I'm the only one that knows the real deal on this thing. Stop supposing. Stop putting your lens on another person's life. Hey, stop withholding love. Who are you to withhold love? I loved you first. Fill up with my love and you'll be able to love many. Do you see? He's already given you what to get rid of in your life. We've just spent, spent the last 11 weeks talking about this. We went into it much, much further and I hope you've worked your workbook. Um, you have to learn who you are with Christ. For some of you, you've had to let down walls to let him in. You maybe blamed God. We talked about forgiveness last week. And one thing I didn't tell you with those little sheets, and I do want to mention it, is that um, sometimes you have to forgive God. It's not that he needs to be forgiven, because he doesn't. But sometimes you need to work through the forgiveness for him. It's not just another person, it's not just yourself, but many times we harbor bitterness and resentment toward God because we don't understand everything that he does and is about. And in defense of God, I would let you know that I love having a God I don't fully understand or know what he's gonna do next because that means he's smarter than me. That would make it easier to trust in a God that I knew was never needing sleep, never needs to take a break, always knows where I am, always knows what I'm doing, and he never leaves me. See, that's a sovereign God who never stops loving us ever, ever, ever. Proverbs 18, 19 says, it's harder to make amends with an offended friend than to capture a fortified city. <laughs> Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with iron bars. Do you know there's two sides to an iron gate? The day my son entered the citadel. I stood there with many other parents as they closed those big iron gates and they had this huge padlock and they put that chain around it and locked them in and I wasn't quite prepared for that. <laughs> and I just fell apart. I 
I felt like he was locked away from me. But he was locked in for the adventure of his life. <laughs> he was on a new path. There was another mother in the crowd who apparently identified with me because she came running over and just wrapped me up in her arms and she goes, it's okay. <laughs> I was you. <laughs> they make it, they make it. <laughs> God had someone right there for me. And he wants that for you. He wants you to know that there's always something bigger. And when you get embraced by his body, by who he is, and you fall in love with the living creator, there's just not a better way to live. There just isn't. You see, giving love is the opposite of selfishness. So when you believe God's love for you is inexhaustible, which it is, you won't need to go to others to get love. You can actually go to others to give love. See, she was a little further along in the journey of the Citadel than I was. I'm so thankful for that mom today because I was going under. <laughs> but she was right there, and she knew, and her confidence helped me even over the next four years as we, our hearts, those little baby boys that we nurtured, that grew under our hearts, became amazing young men. You see, the first step on that upward spiral of having my relationship with others is having an attitude of humility. We have to humble ourselves. Yeah. Can you imagine how silly it would have been if I had just gone no, get away from me. <laughs> no, I was at the bottom. She was scraping me off the pavement and helping me back together. <laughs> and that's what God does with us. Philippians 2, 3 says, don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Now, I know for a fact, I've heard many of you say it, that there are people that you've noticed even come to Beach Church, and you can tell that they're going through a similar thing that you are. You just sort of know it. Do you think you're clairvoyant? No. What it is is that familiar spirit, that Holy Spirit, he is talking to you. He is stirring your spirit up. And I want to stir your spirit up. We're going to be away from each other for the summer, okay? We'll start back in the fall. But I want you to get bolder about moving toward people with love, okay? Maybe it's just a kind word. Maybe it's a, you know, just a quick hug or, or a welcome handshake. The amazing thing is that God uses it all. And most of all, he uses it to change you. You see, it's not the other effect. It's, it's really you reaching out. You getting past yourself to care and to invest in another life. See, Trusting God looks like thanking God for those people and praying for them. You can be confident that what God will do whatever he wants to do with them. How many of you really take time to pray for Pastor Todd? Pray for our leadership. This is your family. This is your spiritual family. For many of us, this is 
This is even more precious than natural family in many ways. This is what it's about. It's about the kind of love that has no obligation. It's freely offered, and we should freely accept it. Philippians 1, 3 to 6 says, Every time I think of you, <laughs> I give thanks to my God. I always pray for you, and I make my requests with a heart full of joy. I am sure that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ comes back again. Now, I think that as believers, we sort of get the idea that we have to be something that we're not yet. And that's okay if you don't put a time and a goal on it. <laughs> Let me explain. See, God knows what your timeline is. He knows every hair on your head, and he knows every single one of your days. So why wouldn't he know every twist and turn of your journey? Right? He knows everything about you. And so we find many believers that are in long road struggles. They have a lot of things that they've had to endure, they've been through, and they've allowed a lot of life to pull them down. When God says, think it not strange when trials and tests come on you. That's part of the journey. Why are you surprised? Do you think when something bad, or what you call bad, happens to you that God and his angels are up there going, oh, do you see what happened? <laughs> no. No, in fact, there are reinforcements there. God was right there. He knew I think one of my favorite uh, drawings that I saw that came out of 9-11 was a child's drawing where um, you saw the souls going up and each one had angels take them. And it was so sweet. It was like, yes, they could see in the unseen and know that every soul that went up was hand-carried to, to the throne room. How amazing. But that's where we should be in our spiritual life, knowing that things can happen at any time, and, and they do. But we don't have to give up. We don't have to be defeated. We can actually move through injured, maybe, hurting, maybe. You might feel like you're limping, maybe. But that is why God's even entrusted you with the trial. Let me talk about that a minute. See, I told you, you've heard my story. You know that, you know, my whole family was in a horrific accident. It wasn't an accident, it was a crime. They planned it. They had rolled that boulder. They had it waiting for someone under that overpass. And I would be undone in grief. Um, I didn't understand PTSD at the, sign, at the time, but I know now that that's what I had gone through, and my husband as well. Uh, we were all victims of that crime. But losing my son was unconscionable to me. And, and you know, I just felt like he was such an innocent that had to die that day, and that no, I would never be happy again. And yet, what happened as I would grow closer to the Lord in this? Because I was a believer. I, it didn't take that tragedy for Bill and Linda Stapleton to find God. We had God. But what we really needed was a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with him. And God used that in our lives to draw us closer and closer and to trust in him. And one of the ways that he showed me that was in the book of Job. And you know, Job was a righteous man, not a perfect man, but someone, a believer. He, he was a, a good man that loved God. And he had a relationship with God. 
And God, in the unseen, if you know the story, he actually talks with Satan, and it's as though God has this big mag flashlight up in heaven, and he goes, ooh, have you considered my servant Job? (coughs) Poor Job. And yet that's how I felt that night on I-26. I felt like out of all the people that travel, why us? Why, God, why? And I had a friend who, I said it out loud, and he just looked at me and goes, Linda, why not you? First, I wanted to punch his lights out. (laughs) It's not the time to do that. But I would come to think about that many times as I would go back into Job and I would read again. And let me just give you food for thought right now. Because I am not God. I do not know all the ways that God thinks. But what if God allowed that to happen because Bill and Linda were the only Christians on that road at that time that would faithfully glorify God and show his goodness to two murderers? What if? You see, when we were able to forgive those boys in that full courtroom, I knew that that was the right thing to do, the only thing to do. I didn't have any hesitation about that. It would come much later when we realized that we could not recalibrate. We couldn't get walking in sync again. We grieve differently, which is a a symptom of Tragedy, you, you have two separate ways of grieving. We couldn't help each other. Uh, the dynamic in marriage is that when one is down, the other one helps the other up. And we couldn't do it. We were both leveled. And yet what God would do in our lives, what he, would, he would do it his way. And he took two stubborn religious people And he began to really soak us with his love. He humbled us. So many people reached out and loved on us that we didn't even know know how humbling it is to receive. We were givers. We love to give. Still do. But I've had to learn over these years to receive graciously and authentically. It still gets me sometimes. (laughs) I am not done yet. (laughs) And that's what I want you to realize, is that all of you are in a journey right now. And what if God, in his mightiness, took that mag light on your life and said, ooh, have you considered them over here? Yeah, yep, they can handle it. They'll glorify me. They'll walk with me. You watch. They won't give up. They're going to be persistent. What if? See, if you're not a soldier fit for battle, how are you going to make it through even other hard times? You know, I think sometimes people think they get saved and they're going to go on a cruise ship (laughs) where everything's done for them. All they have to do is come to a church and everything will happen then. We'll teach your kids. We'll make sure you're okay. And I have news for you. That's not going to happen. We're going to love you and walk alongside you in your journey. Because it's yours. Yours alone. God assigned it to you. He knows what he's got to purge out of you. He also knows how he's going to take care of you and teach you to trust in a God you cannot see, but you know is there. I know you know he's there. He's here tonight. You all brought him in. Come on. He's here because you carry the Holy Spirit with you. And when we're together, he just magnifies and you can feel the energy in the room. You know you can. That's what's so sweet 
about this place. Philippians 1, 3 to 6 says, every time I think of you, come on, I give thanks to my God. See, for the grace of God, I bet there's more than half this room can say, but for the grace of God, I'm even alive. Why do you think you're still alive? For you? Oh, no. I believe you are alive because you are going to learn to proclaim the voice of God and live boldly in a land that hates him. Who wants to call you a fool. And yet he says here, he goes, no, you began a good work in me and you are going to be faithful to complete it. Because that's the kind of God you are. No matter how many days you have on this earth, you need to start realizing this is your journey. Whatever it is. No buts. I know some of you are saying, but Linda, wait a minute. <laughs> no buts. See, instead of judging and fault finding, we're going to be learning and practicing now, this summer, you're going to be out there accepting. Hey, this is the beach. Fish like company stinks after three days. <laughs> so my dad used to always say, I grew up on an island. <laughs> but when you live at the beach, you have a lot of friends. You get a lot of company. And they're all amazing and wonderful. And we love having them come. But we also like to see them go, don't we? <laughs> okay. But you want to do a good job in accepting him in God's love, which I know some of you I met when I did the boundaries class, and you all learned how to set those boundaries, right? <laughs> up front, guys, be up front. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 2 says, Be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. You see, when you truly love, you overlook their faults to see their needs. It's what Jesus did. All of us had faults. All of us are, we've got our human defects and our ways that irritate others, and yet he overlooks our faults to see our need every single time. Start to be that person who accepts people right where they're at and then loves them to the point of helping them move along in their journey. You see, instead of rejecting or withholding love for others, from others, then you can love them by giving to them. I'm not talking money. That's how, that's, you know what, that's actually the easiest commodity to do because it involves nothing except a little extra cash. No, what I'm talking about here is time, understanding, compassion, help. See, these are all things that are actually much more valuable than a dollar bill. It's easy just to throw money at somebody. It's much harder to invest in another life, to love them where they're at. Loving others is always going to cost you something. 1 John 3, 17 to 18 says, but if anyone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need and refuses to help, how can God's love be in that person? Now, he's really tough here on people who have extra money. This is not just about money. I want you to say, this is the ones that have, you have enough money already to live well and sees a brother or sister in need. And they still aren't helping. How can God's love be in that person? It does make you wonder when we look at it in context, doesn't it? But they need God. So even though money won't speak to them, maybe love and compassion and 
human kindness will. You see? Dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. I, I am a, a single parent. I've been a single parent. Uh, my children were five and nine when their father died. And so I lived as a, a, a single parent. Um, I don't, it's, it's, it's weird, I know Todd was talking about labels, and I, knew, I know I'm a widow, but I've never worn that label, it just never felt like it. It felt like a single parent with no child support is what it felt like. <laughs> so it was like, the widow thing, no. <laughs> They're going on cruises. <laughs> you know, I can't leave them for a night, <laughs> you know. So it's a whole different thing. But I want you to see that when we, uh, started coming, God led us right here to, when we arrived in Myrtle Beach, and he led us here to Beach Church, that I got to see God move in all kinds of people, for my children, for our family's needs. It would just come out of nowhere, and we would pray about it, and before we knew it, we would be experiencing it to the point where my daughter would say, I'm going to grow up and write our God stories. <laughs> And I'm not kidding you. She really knew that all of the things that we were seeing was the hand of God and his kindness and his love for my family. Amazing. And I sort of go back to that beginning point. See, we modeled it. I told them, I can't give you cars when you're a teenager. Get that off your plate. It's not going to happen. Don't even dream it. It's not going to happen. And... One of the sweetest things, I'll tell you this story, is my daughter worked all summer at Sonic. And she's a dancer, so she's very graceful, but she could not do those roller skates. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Just took away all her grace, and I, I had pulled in to drop something off to her, and I saw her go down with a whole tray on her spine, and I'm thinking, no, <laughs> nothing is worth this. I said, she, you know, she doesn't even have a uh, workman's comp <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> She's a kid. But she banked all that money, and believe it or not, by the time she got home that night, the manager took away her skates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, God. But she stayed at that and did very well and banked all of her money, and she made a, a good bit of money and uh, set her sight on buying a car because she didn't, she was tired of riding the, um, the bus. She didn't want to ride the bus and she knew she'd have to go up to the uh, Academy of Arts and Science. That's where she went her sophomore year. So she was old enough to work and she was banking all of her money. And so she had come up with enough to, uh, and one of the fellas from our life group had said, you know, Linda, I think I got a car, I can get her. And I said, how much? And he goes, gave me the price and I go, well, She's got it, but barely. And he goes, well, okay, we'll work something out. So she actually got a car. And the amazing thing about it was when she got there, she had it all in cash in an envelope. She'd been salting this away. Is that he told me, he says, I'm not taking her money. And I said, well, do you need it from me? Do, do you? He goes, no, Linda, I'm not taking her money. It's a good car. It'll keep her safe. He says, but I'm not taking her money. And I said, she worked all summer to earn this car. You're taking her money. I said, you have no idea. This is not about you giving. This is about her receiving for a hard job and a good job done. You're going to take that away from her. You're not doing it. So he thought a minute, and he goes, ooh, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. Okay. I said, you take her money. He goes, okay, but I'm not selling it for, I said, just do what you're going to do. He asked, so he asked for a ridiculously low price, but it was still formidable. And she put that envelope over there and gave that to him with full confidence that she was getting a good car. And uh, we were really happy she drove that, that car and it did her uh, pretty well, I think, I think her uh, first year of college or something like that. Anyway, when she graduated um, the next year as, as you know, a senior in high school, 
She got a car from that, a card from that fellow, a graduation card. Yeah. <laughs> In the same envelope. <laughs> he goes, college fund now. <laughs> See, the result of loving others is healthy relationships. A stranger could have wrote her that check, could have come another way, but God was teaching us to do the right thing, trust him above all other things, and keep walking. Loving others does not require feelings. This is where it gets sticky. Because some of you walk by your feelings and your roller coasters. Okay. Uh, some circles call it manic depressive. <laughs> But it's hard to give if you don't like somebody and they need something. And we go back to that rejection part again where it's, you may knowingly be withholding something you could give to help a situation out, but you just don't want to. God says he wants you to be loving even if you don't feel like doing it. I don't think Jesus felt like dying on the cross. I don't. In fact, didn't he ask his father, if you can pass this cup from me, please? But see, we forget that as believers, we are on a journey, and where are we heading? To the cross. The same road that Jesus did. It's not a cruise ship. Not at all. It really is a path that's going to involve pain, suffering, self-denial, giving when it hurts. but the person that you act lovingly towards will feel loved as soon as you act because they already know that you really don't want to, but you are. And that you care enough about them to do it. Believe it or not, later you may find out that your feelings have caught up to your actions. Because you are going to know and be proud of yourself as unto God because you listened and did it for him, the audience of one. You see? 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us show it by our actions. You know, God has a purpose and a plan for your life that include the tears, the heartache, the struggle, the losses, as much as he does the gains and the abundant blessing and the relationships of others. This is all part of the earth condition. One day it will be heaven. And we will be there with the God of all gods that knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows each one of you so individually that he knows what's going to bring you to himself. He really does. And some of you are really stubborn and hard-headed. You can join my club. <laughs> you see, God loves us more than you could ever, ever imagine. It breaks his heart to see us suffering and yet he knows it is for our good, that he's going to work it all out. Who are we to withhold love from anyone? So now you know what not 
to do. This is going to lead to broken relationships. But I can guarantee that if you start living this way, with humility, trusting God, accepting others just for who they are, not for what they can give you or what you can give them, and giving, not to them, not to another, but really to God, knowing that God will honor your gracious and generous spirit. This is what real love is about. This is where you're going to be tried and you're tested in all of this. I bet, on, I bet out of these four, everybody at the table could pick one that they're going through right now. Because this is what a journey is made up of. <laughs>